chapter, verses 7 through 18. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then? The crowd asked. John answered, The man with two tunics should share with him who has none, and the one who has food should do the same. Tax collectors also came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Christ. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his flesh, threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and preached the good news to them. So I have to tell you that I do not consider myself to be an intimidating person whatsoever. But when I do the children's message, it's like I magically turn into the scariest person that's ever walked the face of the earth. So in our series about coming home for Christmas, today we talk about the joy of coming home. And perhaps the idea of joy seems strange when we look at it in the context of our scripture today. See, we see in our scripture today, John the Baptist preparing the way for Christ. And in this scripture, at least at the beginning, there does not seem to be a lot of joy to be had there. Right? We find John starting off with some pretty strong words for the people coming to see him. You brood of vipers. You'd better start being the type of people to bear fruit. Because if you don't, the axe is coming for you. And you will be cast into the fire. Not exactly the sort of thing that makes you think about joy, is it? Although I imagine John did get some joy in calling them a brood of vipers. That's a good line to use. But here's the thing about joy and good news. You see, you can't have good news if there is no bad news. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, why not? Shouldn't all things always be good? Shouldn't all things always have a feeling of joy with them? Well, yeah, that'd be great. But if you don't ever experience anything bad or anything that is tough to handle in life, you can't really know what joy is. Think of it this way. If everything was always wonderful, if there was never any hard times, then joy would just be the normal feeling that you would have. And if that's the normal feeling that you have at all times, you wouldn't know it was joy. You would just think that it was the normal baseline feeling. I'm guessing most of you have seen the movie It's a Wonderful Life at some point in your lifetime. Now, just in case you haven't, or it's been so long that you can't quite really remember it other than it's in black and white and Jimmy Stewart's in it, I'll give you a brief overview. You see, George Bailey is living a pretty normal, happy life until his uncle makes a mistake and puts George 
in a position where he is going to lose everything. George makes a wish that he had never been born, and then his guardian angel shows him what it w- the world would have been like if he was never born. George gets a chance to see how his life has impacted so many people around him. And in the end, he realizes that it is good that he has lived, even though he is facing a huge difficulty in his life. He then finds that there is joy to be had in that life that he is leading. You see, sometimes we need to see how bad things can be before we can understand that there is joy even in the little things of life. Now, when we look at John, perhaps you have never considered him to be a joyful person. After all, living in the wilderness, eating locusts and honey, well, at least the locust part, doesn't really sound like it would bring us a lot of joy, does it? But I want you to think about the first time that John meets Jesus. See, the first time that John meets Jesus, they are both still in their mother's wombs. And in Luke chapter 1, when Elizabeth, John's mother, heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. So John leaps in his mother's womb because of the joy that he has for Jesus. And even in our scripture today, there is joy in what John is doing. Now what the people might be hearing is not joyful, but what John is doing is joyful. His work for the Lord, he is doing it with zeal and from the bottom of his heart. And he tries to convey the idea to these people as well. They ask him, what should we do? We don't want to be chopped down and thrown into the fire. And John gives them, each according to their position in life, advice on what they should be doing. If you have two of something and someone has none, give them one. If you have food and they do not, give them food. And all these ideas can really be boiled down to They should be living lives that are kind, caring, honest, and they should have joy in the fact that they can be saved by the one that is coming. You see, in this season, it is so easy for us to become overwhelmed with all the things that we have to do. We can bemoan the fact that there is so little sunshine as the weather becomes colder and more dreary. And the fact that it gets dark five minutes after noon. So we can dwell on all those negative things because they are there. We can focus on all the bad that is going on in the world. We can do this or we can choose to look for the joy in all the things that are part of our life. You see, we might find ourselves like George Bailey in a difficult spot financially. And we might think, Who would be better if I wasn't even born? Or we can look around and say, yes, it is hard right now. But look at the joy that I have brought to others in their lives. Or look at how I could bring joy to them. We can allow ourselves to get bogged down in all the things that need to be done this season. And say, what is the point? I'll never do it all. And I'll never do it as well as I would like. Or we can choose to live in joy and say, thank you, God, for allowing me one more Christmas season. Or allowing me to be in a position to do things to help bring joy to others. We can say, oh no, another dreary day. Or we can say, thank you, Lord, for another day. Thank you for the light that you provided for us. Thank you for the snow and for the rain that help our crops grow and provide us with water. See, you can find yourself like John, feeling that you are out in the wilderness with nothing to eat but locusts and honey. You can look at your predicament and you can say, why me, God? Why am I the one that you have chosen to carry the burden of making the way for Christ? Or you can choose to live in joy and say, thank you, Father, for providing me with what I need. Thank you for the chance to be the one that helps to show others the way to Christ in this season. 
Now, if I'm being honest with you, which is always my goal, I have not always been the one to choose joy. I think to one Christmas Eve when we only had two children at the time, and we were eating dinner at my mother-in-law's, as we do before we go to Christmas Eve service every year. Now that year, and perhaps you remember it as well, there was a snowstorm that kicked up around 4 p.m., and it was one that no one was prepared for. And as such, the roads did not get salted ahead of time. And now Carlin wanted to go to Christmas Eve service, and I did not. I did not want to risk coming up the hill to the church in this snowstorm, knowing that as it snowed and we were in services, the roads are just going to get worse and worse, and the trip home is going to be even tougher than the trip to get here. And I know that I thought to myself, why would this happen tonight? And I told Carlin, I don't think it's a good idea that we go. And we go to church nearly every Sunday. Surely we can miss Christmas Eve service this year. And Carlin was not hearing it. And we went to Christmas Eve service just like we do each year. And now I stewed and I steamed the whole way to the church. I had a great big pity party for myself the whole time we were traveling. And I have to tell you that when I entered that church building, there was about zero joy in my heart. But while we were there, I was reminded about how special each Christmas Eve service can be. How the feeling of joy and warmth almost permeates through everyone that is there. The joy of seeing so many people in the church. The joy of seeing people that you haven't seen for some time. It was like I was the Grinch and my heart grew three sizes in service that night. You can see there was joy to be had in coming home to the church for Christmas. Now often when I'm feeling like, why me, Lord? Why are you putting this on me? I think back to that day. I remember that there is joy to be had in all things, especially when worshiping and serving God. I remember that he has called us to be a joyous people. We are not to be people that go around and mope and complain. We are a joyous people. And for me, that feeling of joy, it was like a shot in the arm to my spirit. And that is what joy can be for us at times. It can be the spirit boost that we need. And the greatest thing about joy is this. The more that you share it, the greater it becomes in your life. Joy does not diminish when you share it with others. Joy only grows larger in your life when you share it with others. And so as we move closer to Christmas, let us do so with joy in our hearts. Let each time we gather to worship be filled with joy. And let us allow that joy to refill our lives when we are feeling low. Let the good news that Jesus is coming again, just like he did on the first Christmas, fill us with so much joy that we can't help but see it everywhere that we look. My challenge for you this week is this. Where can you find joy in your life? And how can you use it this Christmas season to help spread the good news? Amen.